Today we're talking about financial regulation, a topic that sounds less like life-changing legislative accomplishments and more like an 8am class that I was the only one to show up to. It shouldn't come as a surprise, but most people who are passionate about how the government manages money have money. And lots of it. That makes this the one issue that can get bipartisan support under any presidency. So what happened? Oh, years of financial sector lobbying have succeeded in persuading the House of Representatives to approve the biggest rollback of banking rules since Dodd-Frank. Well, that did pass in the House, making this one of the few times people who put money into a house were excited to hear about bank deregulation. Now, as you can imagine, he could have been speaking Spanish and it would have made just about as much sense to most people watching. So in this episode, we're talking about how this passed and what it actually contained. First, what happened? Well, the US House of Representatives really came together in a vote of 258 to 159 to pass this piece of legislation in order to help out the struggling banks. Okay, so maybe not struggling. In fact, American banks had their most profitable quarter ever last year. But you know what they say, if it's working better than ever, make drastic changes. Alright, so let's talk about the actual bell. Well, I sometimes make jokes about complicated things making people's eyes glaze over, but quoting people on this would be like providing a literary analysis of the nutritional facts on a box of your favorite overprocessed cereal. So I'm not going to bother, and instead I'm just going to start from scratch. First we're talking about how it exempts small banks from the Volcker rule. You might not believe it, but there is such thing as a small bank. Yes, I know that sounds like an almost mythical thing at this point, but it's true. Just look at Oakwood State Bank. My name is Roddy Wiley. I'm the president of the Oakwood State Bank, the smallest bank in America. The smallest bank in America has 600 customers. The Oakwood State Bank has nearly $3 million in total assets, which is, well, as close to the opposite of too big to fail as you can get without being an amateur YouTube channel. I feel like bankers spend that kind of money every month on NDAs alone. Anyways, the argument that some people make is that maybe this ma and pa bank should be regulated differently than your Goldman Sachs's. In this case, we're talking about the Volcker Rule, a rule that basically says that any commercial bank cannot make risky bets with their customers' deposits. You see, a major reason the big banks failed was that they invested huge amounts of money in risky assets. I'm talking so much money Scott Pruitt might not even spend it on a desk. This doesn't mean that banks can't invest though, they just have to not take risks. Now you might say, the safest investment is to put your money into a bank, but there are other options, like loaning money and buying government bonds, just not sexy finance. This bill makes it so that small banks do not have to abide by the Volcker rule anymore. Specifically, the bill would create an exemption from prohibitions on proprietary trading for banks with less than $10 billion in assets, and trading assets and trading liabilities less than 5% of total assets. I know, radical, right? Next you're going to be telling me you like to squeeze a little lemon in with your water before drinking it. This is alarming for some though because the community banks are the primary lenders of money for houses and small business loans. So encouraging their money towards making riskier investments is counterproductive on many levels. Critics also argue that the Volcker rule applies to federal deposit insurance protected banks. So the small banks are gambling with someone else's money, your money. If they lose, then the government will pay back what it was in people's checking accounts. So why not take risks? Hmm, I think a great opportunity just opened up at the roulette table. Let me invest our money on black. On the other side, you have people like Paul Mursky, a lobbyist from the Independent Community Bankers of America. They sound like a fun bunch. He argues, the more regulations roll back, the more time and resources banks have to focus on their communities and customers. The goal in their mind would be to make community banks not have to spend the onerous amounts they currently do proving that they abide by all of these regulations. That 
might not really be necessary for institutions of their insignificance. It is true that since 2008, when Dodd-Frank had passed, the only thing to take a bigger hit than a community bank was people's enthusiasm for DC movies. There are a few main problems for smaller banks being unable to invest. First is a liquidity problem. If you're the Oakwood State Bank we talked about earlier and you need to get money back into your vaults, you can't just start leaning on people you've loaned money to if something happens. Hey, I know that loan we gave you last week. Yeah, I hope you didn't buy that house yet because we're going to need it back. A bank without money is like Trump without Fox News. Powerless. The other big problem is that all this paperwork is expensive and well, come on, it's paperwork. No one's ever winning an election on a pro additional paperwork platform. But this I think will add to the momentum that we're seeing because it is the small businesses that need the loans and they haven't been getting them. They've been deprived partially because of this onerous regulation known as Dodd-Frank. All right, so next point. It raises what's called the SIFI threshold from 50 billion to 250 billion. So what is sci-fi? Well, it's how the hip youths refer to systemically important financial institutions. Word. This is a change in regulation that would go towards helping your mom and pop $200 billion banking group. Now, after the financial collapse, we started to use the term too big to fail in reference to companies that might have been more systemically important than the federal government, an entity that has shut down three times since the collapse. Naturally, if you think there are companies whose well-being is critical to the well-being of your nation, you're probably going to want to keep them alive, so they endure additional regulation. Under Dodd-Frank, any financial institution with more than $50 billion in assets is a structurally significant institution, which may be a little bit of an exaggeration considering that's the amount of value Facebook lost within two days after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Wow, no wonder Facebook finally gave us these sad and angry reactions to posts. Anyways, the rules are that any systemically important financial institutions have to go through so much bureaucracy I'm surprised you don't see banks selling off enough stuff to get out of that label. We're talking special stress tests, developing resolution plans, and maintaining certain levels of liquidity and financial capacity to absorb losses. Being rich is a nightmare. Just by changing this, you're looking at probably savings in terms of compliance costs between in the tens of millions for the smaller banks up to hundreds of millions for the larger banks. It now changed the rules so that systemically important financial institutions are instead any company with more than $250 billion in assets, a quarter of a trillion dollars. Yeah, I feel like if anyone has that much money, we can just end Earth. It's like the second to last round of Monopoly before someone finally ends up flipping the table. Clearly you won this game. Why keep playing? One final thing this bill does is let banks loan out more money while holding back less. If you're in a conversation with someone who's really into this stuff or wants to seem smart, they'll call this a leverage ratio. This leaves banks vulnerable to losing more money if the market fails, or if not being able to pay everyone back at once who demands it. But like every other potentially business ending decisions, you can make more money if you do it right. This adjustment is only a few percentage points and only applies to banks with less than $10 billion in assets, so it's not exactly world ending. Anyways, let's just hope that these now systemically non-important financial institutions remember to fail one at a time, or we might have a problem on our hands. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, if you want to support nonpartisan comedic reporting, please subscribe to my channel and like below. Thank you for watching.